is Fox 12 Now. And hello, everyone. This is Fox 12 Now. I'm Greg Nibbler. Thanks for joining us. Uh, we do appreciate it. We are live streaming here every weekday, starting at 1 p.m., going throughout the afternoon, covering a wide range of topics. And we get to have longer conversations and go a little deeper than we may be able to in other news shows. And something we've been covering here quite a bit is the announcement from Amazon in partnership with Energy Northwest and X Energy, the plans that they're going to be building four nuclear energy facilities on the Columbia River up near Richland, Washington. This is, in theory, to power some of their data farms that are up there. And the particular kind of nuclear energy facilities are called SMR, which is Small Modular Reactors. Now, that's a lot of information there, and we want to dig a little bit deeper into this and just find out more about what these are. What is an SMR? Uh, what should we know about these kinds of facilities? What should we know about as far as concerns? And to do so, we need experts, and that is why we are joined right now by from the Nuclear Science and Engineering Department at Oregon State, Trevor Kent. And Trevor, thanks for, for being here with us. I really appreciate it and excited to learn from you about this because... I've just said a bunch of acronyms and I've used the word nuclear a bunch. There's a lot that I don't know and that's why I'm happy to have you here with us. Yeah, it's great to be here. You know, our, our industry uses a ton of different acronyms, you know, around the board. I say the first one is really that small modular reactor bit, right? Reactors have been around for quite some time. Small just means that it's something smaller than what you expect from a large power reactor. So large power reactors are about a thousand megawatts electric. Uh, usually, when we're talking about SMRs, we're talking something in about one tenth to one third uh, that size range, and they come in a variety of different shapes and sizes. So, uh, X Energies is actually a gas uh, type reactor, so a little different than the standard uh, light water reactors that you'd see, uh, especially across the river at uh, Columbia Generating Station. Um, really, SMRs have been around for quite some time, but the, what really makes them unique and the reason that a lot you see a lot of these companies looking for SMR. Um, is because it's about that economy of scale. You know, it used to be that, hey, if you have, you want to build one large big facility uh, to generate your power, but what they were finding is that that limits the amount of overall reactors you built. So it takes longer to actually build uh, these larger scales. It ends up being a large amount of capital. So it tends to be uh, a high risk cost. Uh, so very few people can invest in, in buying these things. So the idea with small modular reactors is what you end up doing is you actually make them smaller. You make it so that you can put them uh, on the grid like right away. And then as you continue to generate power, generate revenue, then you can add additional modules, additional units as needed. Uh, one of really the, the big benefits that comes out of being a small modular reactor is that the reactor itself produces uh, you know, much less power, right? That that one tenth, one you know, one quarter of the amount of power, uh, which really means that there's a lot less heat to remove. In some cases, uh, some of these smaller modular designs, or even if you go down to the micro reactor case, uh, don't even require additional cooling. They are naturally cooled by air uh, or other gas. So. Wow. Okay, that that does make a lot of sense. So it's just kind of a piecemeal way to go about it to build up to where it is that you need. Um, essentially, you know, go, going from that smaller scale. You know, if you look at it, say, say compared to something like, you know, the old Trojan nuclear plant and that giant, you know, facility that was there on the Columbia River for so long, it's no longer there. Uh, but when you compare something like that to one of these, what are we talking about as far as appearance and, and I guess, size of space that it would take up? Yeah, it really depends on the type of modules or, you know, the size of the overall plant that you're going to, you know, install. Uh, if you're just installing one reactor, it's going to be, you know, substantially smaller than if you had, you know, a full series of, you know, 10 modules or so tied together to generate, you know, that full 1000 megawatt electric capacity. So really it depends on, you know, the needs of the utility that's buying up uh, the reactor and where they want to put it. Uh, in some cases, it may be very small. And, and the thing to keep in mind is that, you know, I, I think this is one of the things that I learned, you know, when I was first uh, learning about nuclear power and becoming a nuclear engineer was that there's a wide variety of reactors uh, out there. You know, Oregon State, for example, has its trigger reactor. There's even another research reactor uh, at Reed College, Liberal Arts College in Portland. Uh, it's actually run and operated by students. Uh, so they're much, much smaller scale. So they're even, even smaller than what we typically consider an SMR. Uh, they're really smaller, about one megawatt thermal, uh, thermal power. And they're used for science and, and research activities. 
Um, so if you're talking about these SMRs, it really depends on what company, uh, what they're marketing, they're designed to be advertised as, and whether or not um, you're going to have one unit or several. So you could be upwards the size of a Trojan plant uh, if you're building a very large plant overall, or you can be something that would be very, very small and, and fit in a small building. So it really depends on, on which type of plant you're buying and what you're doing there. Uh, when you look at these SMRs and, and understanding too that there are various kinds of those too and various ways that those can be put together, but when you're looking at SMRs, how advanced is the technology now compared to what it used to be as far as um, taking care of any waste material that comes out of that and mitigating any risks that could be associated with that? Yeah, so when it comes down to waste, uh, one of the things that's actually improved, even in existing older reactors, um, is actually looking at the the fuel itself and, and how much fuel you have and you're you're utilizing. And uh, you know, I, I guess maybe the best way to put it is one man's trash is another man's treasure. A lot of what is considered nuclear waste isn't even waste. Uh, most of it is natural uranium. It's just that the fuel itself hasn't got is at a state where it can't sustain a nuclear reaction. Now, these, uh, the way they get around it with some of these more advanced designs is either use a type, fast type breeder reactor, which basically takes your uranium, your natural occurring uranium, that would otherwise be not suitable for fuel, and it turns it uh, into a fuel version. So you're taking this, what would be isotopic uranium-238 and converting it to uranium-235 as you run your reactor. So in essence, these breeder type reactors, what they're doing is that they're generating fuel as they continue to run. Uh, and so that reduces the overall impact of waste per, per power level. And one of the ways you do that is by increasing the, uh, the overall enrichment levels. Um, so typical power reactors operate at about 4% uh, enrichment. Um, and so these new SMRs, some of the new designs are going to stick around that enrichment. Others are trying to increase that enrichment, so that level of uranium-235. Uh, to 238 to upwards of 20%, uh, which is the regulatory uh, limit for uh, for any type of uh, non um, <clears throat> sorry for any type of uh, non specialized reactor. Uh, for example, Oregon State uh, its trigger reactor up until about 2008 2009 operated with about 20% or uh, sorry operated with about 70 plus percent enriched fuel, and that was lowered to 20% uh, due to the Global Threat Reduction Initiative. So they converted all these old research and test reactors and brought them down to 20% or less enrichment. Uh, the benefit that these SMRs are getting again by increasing that level of enrichment is really to go through uh, and increase that amount of burn up and. What that burnup number is, is it's how much of the fuel use you get over the course of the lifetime of the fuel. And by doing that, you're overall reducing the amount of waste. So burnup, if you even look at now, like modern, you know, modern fuels in old reactors, uh, that burnup has already, you know, has basically doubled. Uh, so they've more or less reduced the amount of waste being produced, the amount of high level waste being produced by the reactors by half. So you get twice the amount of usage of your fuel. The SMRs, these new design, allow you to change even more things. Uh, something like a high temperature gas reactor uh, allows you to have a lot less risk in tear it to your fuel. So it allows you to increase your burn up limit even further and reduces the overall amount of waste uh, that you're continuing to produce. Wow, so the, the technology has vastly changed then from uh, it, what it yeah. used to be and, and the ability is there. So that's, that's really interesting to find out about that. Um, something else, you know, that a lot of people are bringing up because they're finding out, you know, these four facilities are planned. Uh, realistically, they're actually, I think, on Hanford actual land um, near Richland. And now for something like this, for these facilities being by the Columbia River, is there anything that the communities would need to be concerned with or realistic uh, expectations of potential danger associated with these SMR facilities? Yeah, so the risk of SMRs in particular compared to existing reactors is substantially smaller, right? That that risk is dependent upon how your reactor is designed versus how, you know, versus how large it is, right? So one of the challenges with nuclear power uh, is that when you shut down a reactor, you still have residual heat. It's one of the, the benefits that you get you get from these things that allows nuclear power to exist. Now the challenge and, and the real concern is, well, how do you keep reactors cool? Well, the smaller your reactor is, the cooler it can be. 
just naturally. So there's a lot less cooling involved with it. So there's a lot less risk tied with that. And also keep in mind, even for the large reactors, the older reactors uh, that you're seeing is that the risk involved with those is already incredibly small. And I know, you know, having it, having on that site, I know that Hanford kind of gets, becomes a very touchy subject, especially because Hanford was originally designed and developed during, you know, or basically planned out during the 1940s, and it was explicitly chosen by the U.S. government while part of that Manhattan Project, while they were trying to build nuclear weapons. And then as, you know, and a lot of the, you know, the outcomes of that was really very fast, and they were burying a lot of things that were dedicated directly to plutonium production. And so what ends up happening is that there kind of ends up being a convolution between what Hanford was and what nuclear power is. They're actually completely separate entities. Um, so I know that, you know, especially kind of growing up near, near that region, there's a lot of general distrust uh, tied to that because they found out a lot more. They didn't know what was happening, especially back in the 40s, because it was, it was wartime and they were looking to try and produce the bomb before Germany did. But, you know, looking back on it, when they find, they just keep on finding lots of things as a result of that weapons production. But the, I think the important thing for people to, to really remember and consider is that the waste and everything tied with Hanford was military weapons area production, which has nothing to do with the civilian nuclear fleet and management and waste tied to that uh, or any, anything in regards to that. So... That's the, you know, I, I think that's the kind of my, my point when it comes down to, you know, to Hanford and the siding and, and the important things to kind of keep and consider and separate. Yeah, really important to, to differentiate between those two types of, of production that have, have the word nuclear in there, but uh, yeah, two very different things. Um, looking at, you know, for, for utilizing SMRs like this, do you think that this could be a, a realistic solution to some of the energy needs that you know, the country has as it goes toward more electrification of things and getting away from fossil fuels. Is nuclear energy going to be one of those things that we will need to invest in, in your opinion, to, to go towards those goals? Oh, yeah, I, I think it's really important. I, I think, you know, especially looking at wind and solar and nuclear and um, even geothermal and even looking at ways of, of cleaning coal or reducing our reliance on, on fossil fuels, especially when it comes to, to climate, uh, all those, that full package is important. And where the question is really, well, where does nuclear fit, you know, into that mix? Um, nuclear is really the only clean energy source right now that we don't have to have, you know, we don't have to worry about exactly where we build it in terms of, you know, what resources are naturally available there. You know, our, our concerns are, are more tied to the communities and areas around it. Um, versus something like hydro, we're effectively tapped out of our, our hydro resources uh, at this point. I mean, you know, the both the Columbia, you know, at, has the Columbia and the Snake River on either side of Oregon have tons and tons of, of dams around them that generate a ton of power. Um, but even hydro came with its cost, you know, I, one of my my biggest dreams to see, you know, before maybe a bucket list thing would actually be to see uh, Salilo Falls return uh, and have that returned along uh, just outside of the Dalles. Um, but hydro's tapped out, and you're looking at then uh, ramping up wind and solar, which have limited resources. But the pr challenges with wind and solar um, is that they're very dependent on time of day, and that doesn't necessarily line up with how we use it. How you know how we use power? I don't know about you, but I'm not going home at noon to do my laundry and cook and everything. You know, I have a job. I'm here at the office. Uh, mostly. So that means that when the sun goes down, when I am home and using up all my power resources, solar and, you know, solar and my power usage don't necessarily align. Same with wind. It's not always consistent and reliable. Some areas are great. They have great consistency and reliability. Uh, other places, not so much. And so they can turn on and turn off. And solar and wind tend to use up large amounts of land to generate the same amount of power uh, as any sort of thermal generating plant. And nuclear, really where that fits in is that ultimately it's a lot less, you know, it's a lot less land usage, it has one of the lowest land usages of any power source. And that's not just including where you site and locate it, but it also includes the resources required for mining uh, of uranium and mining of materials for the plant. When you start to consider those things into solar and wind, you find out that solar, both solar and wind end up 
involving a lot of carbon costs tied to the mining and resources, especially when it comes to solar solar panels and reaching their end of their life. You still have to deposit those and, and get rid of those somewhere. And so what ends up happening when you start to compare all these resources, you find that uh, really nuclear and wind tend to be the most, uh, most uh, climate savvy when it comes down to reducing the overall uh, greenhouse gas emissions, uh, and then solar ends up being uh, a little bit higher. But really, if you're looking at overall environmental impact, uh, nuclear is very small and very contained compared to these other resources. And nuclear on top of that can provide baseload energy and has been shown to follow, you know, follow peaks pretty well. It's something that the nuclear power industry has developed uh, efficiently over the past, uh, past few years is that ability to load follow uh, and follow as everyone comes home, you know, turns on their oven, turns on their TV, uh, starts watching Fox, uh, Fox 12. <laughs> Uh, they start to actually see that power, you know, you, when you see that power increase, those power plants can actually follow with it. And so nuclear fits really, really well into that mix. And so, you know, if you're if you're trying to reduce these, these greenhouse gas emissions, it's really that nice balanced mix. You use the energy resources you have uh, and you try and get everything online as quickly as possible. Um, thank you so much for joining us here today to talk about this, you know, and go over it. Cause this is, uh, you know, it's a complicated thing I think for people who aren't in the industry to, to understand. And uh, you've definitely uh, made it, made it make a lot more sense. Is there anything else that's really important that you think people should know about SMRs in general? Yeah, I, I think last, you know, the, the really the last kind of thing is, well, one, you know, go out, look around, educate yourself, figure out, you know, what actually is going on because the nuclear world, uh, when it comes down to nuclear power and nuclear resources is is very, very different. And even SMRs, every every company that's designing building or even has been licensed for an SMR uh, really has their own unique design that operates in its own unique way. So they're, you know, not all SMRs, not all reactors are even, you know, even equal. And I think the last, you know, last thing I want want people to realize is there's always that kind of that big concern with, well, how long, you know, how long are these things going to actually take to build? Um, you know, especially if you look at the two newest nuclear power plants that came online in Georgia, those took about 15 years uh, overall to construct. But if you look at the history of how long it actually takes to build these things and how fast they're building them in other parts of the world, so not just, you know, not just the U.S., but China, Japan, and Europe, uh, it's pretty, and even looking at the U.S. average construction time, it's actually a lot closer to about six years. And in some cases, it's even as low as about five years to build uh, any nuclear facility and get it on online and do so uh, in a very safe and productive manner. So I think that's the kind of the biggest thing there is don't rule it out, you know, think about all the options. Yeah, well, Trevor, thank you very much for joining us to talk about this. I really, really appreciate you know your input on it and your expertise on this. Uh, it was great having a conversation with you. Thanks so much. Yeah, thank you, Greg, appreciate it. And for everybody who's watching too, we are live here from the Fox 12 Oregon Newsroom and uh, we're gonna take a break. We'll come back here in just a little bit. I do have coming up later on though, uh, around two o'clock, we're gonna actually gonna talk to Energy Northwest about their side of this, about these new facilities. Uh, for Amazon and just how they fit into it. And so that's, again, coming up at 2 o'clock. You can join me for that. We've got more coming up at 1.30. So we're here through.